I am, however, imperfectly a Christ follower. I follow Christ. I pay attention to who Christ is. I pay attention to what's important to him. And I try to do what he did, what he does, what he commands us to do. And a defining scripture, as I mentioned this morning, a, a defining scripture in understanding Christ's ministry in this world is John 1.14, which says that Christ came from the Father, directly from the Father, full of love and full of truth. And these two aspects of Christ's ministry are the model that, to, to which all of us should aspire. And they are aspects that are in tension with one another. They don't harmonize very well. Being loving is to be pastoral. And to be pastoral, when Christ was pastoral, he was feeding the hungry, he was, he was healing the sick, he was uh, offering redemption to lost souls. That's pastoral. But when he was prophetic, he was confronting the culture. He was confronting the religious leaders of his day. He was confronting the secular culture over, among other things, injustice. And Jesus was very, very troubled by injustice. He chided the religious leaders of his day in Matthew 23, 23, where he says, you're doing righteous works. And that's a good thing but you're ignoring the weightier matters, which he said begin with justice. Jesus cares about justice. In Isaiah 59, God says that he looked and was displeased that there was no justice, but he was appalled, he was appalled that there was no one to intervene. Being displeased is, is, a, is a lower level of disapproval than being appalled. When somebody's appalled at something, they're outraged by it, and it outrages the heart of God when injustice abounds and his own people are passing by on the other side. And we are passing by on the other side. Every pastor I have ever met, without exception, tells me that they are pro-life. Praise God for that. But in the 25th chapter of Matthew, Christ foretells his return to judge all mankind. He's going to separate the sheep from the goats, if you will. And he says the evaluative criteria by which he's going to make that separation is works related. Now that's a shocking thing to say to evangelicals because we know that we're not saved by works. We're saved by faith. And yet here's Jesus saying, you go to the left, you go to the right, based on what? Your works. But it's not your works that decide whether you go left or right. Your works are merely the evidence of whether your, safe is, your faith is or is not a saving faith. And James taught that faith without works is dead. We will not be saved by a dead faith. We can only be saved by a living faith. And our works determine whether our faith is living or whether our faith is dead. So it's not the word. We, we can't work our way into heaven. We're not good enough. Paul talks about that on and on. Faith, not by works, lest any man should boast and all of that. But read the 25th chapter of Matthew. It's a scary deal. It scares me. Anyway, I don't know if it scares you. It scares me. The parable of the talents in, in Matthew 25 scares me. It's Jesus saying... We've given you these talents, and now we're going to step back and we're going to see how you use them. And we're going to judge how you use them. And there will be eternal consequences to that judgment. So works are a very, very serious thing. And Jesus does not say in the 25th chapter of Matthew that he's going to ask on, on the day of judgment whether we were pro-nutrition. He's going to ask whether we fed the hungry. He's not going to ask whether we were pro-hydration. He's going to ask whether we gave drink to the thirsty. He's not going to ask whether we were pro-life. He's going to ask what we did to save babies. 
And when Jesus was asked what a person has to do to be saved, and evangelicals often forget that the parable of the Good Samaritan starts in, in the 10th chapter of Luke, it starts with Jesus being asked what? What, what? what was the threshold question? What must I do to inherit eternal life? I mean, that's the quintessential evangelical question. And as Jesus works his way down through his answer, the bottom line is the Good Samaritan took enormous risks and made enormous sacrifices, and yet, and Jesus said, you do this and, and, and you will live, most of what most churches, most Christians, most religious leaders, Christian leaders are doing in defense of life doesn't cost them anything, and it doesn't risk anything, and I would submit that to that degree, it's not going to be very impressive to our Lord. When, 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 when he asks what we've done and the stuff we, we list, we enumerate as our fulfillment of that obligation we have to defend life, to love our neighbor as ourselves, with the unborn child being our neighbor, it better be, have, have been risky stuff and it better have been costly stuff or scripture suggests it's not going to be very impressive. Now, I hate that. I hate that because I don't like taking risks, and I don't like making sacrifices, but there it is. I didn't write it. We've got to deal with it. I mean, you can pretend it's not there, but it's there, and I'll tell you this, not being preached. That's not being preached, and because it's not being preached, we have a lot of evangelicals just sort of floating along, thinking, I'm okay, you're okay, not, you know, but this kind of thing isn't going to matter. It's going to matter if God's word can be believed, which I think it can. <clears throat> I am not a pro-life advocate. We have a lot of those. Most of the pro-life movement is full of pro-life advocates. Praise God for that. We need them. I'm thankful for that. The writers, the bloggers, the, you know, the speaker training people, whatever, all important. I'm an anti-abortion activist. That's a, that's a very different kind of species. Pro-life advocates tend to be pastoral. Anti-abortion activists tend to be prophetic. Excuse me while I take a pill. I was apparently, if you'll forgive a personal reference, bitten by a tick about six years ago and have contracted Lyme disease. So it was only diagnosed a little over a year ago. Lyme disease, the booty and the alcohol. Don't get Lyme disease. It's a very bad, it is a very bad deal. Yeah, I know. I have to have a couple of goes at this. I'm only saying that because I didn't want you to think I needed a pill to steady my nerves up here. <laughs> You're an intimidating group, but, but not that intimidating. <laughs> Mach, you'll be relieved to know that most of what you see, the residue on the bottom of the cup, is industrial red dye number six with no therapeutic value. So I'm probably better off if I don't drink it. I'm, I, I'm offering this distinction to make the point that <clears throat> wars are won by fighting and Anti-abortion activists fight, and the, the tendency of pro-life advocates is to appease. The tendency of the church is to appease. The tendency of the church is to avoid a fight within the church, avoid a fight with the secular culture. And that's a problem, because as I'm about to contend, my reading of scripture suggests very strongly that Jesus went way out of his way to pick fights in a, in, a, in a very belligerent sort of way. 
He was pugnacious. I mean, almost it's almost shocking how combative he was capable of being when he was in his prophetic mode. Now, when he's in his in his pastoral mode, you, you, you get a very different sense of who Jesus is. But this prophetic Jesus, the Jesus who takes the whip and wrecks the temple, um, we, we've sort of written out of our faith. And it, it's, it mildly amuses me that so many evangelicals are so up in arms over the secular culture. Every Christmas, you're going to get all these newspaper stories. Christians lamenting that the secular culture has taken Jesus out of Christmas and all we've got is Santa Claus. And then we get the same thing at Easter. The secular culture has taken Christ out of the risen Christ. He's out of Easter and all we get is the Easter bunny. And yet the church today, the Catholic church and our organization is half Catholic and half evangelical. The church today has written the prophetic Jesus, more or less, out of the gospel. And just as clearly as, as, uh, as the Christ child has been written out of Christmas by the secular culture and the risen Christ out of Easter, and as a consequence of that, the church is this sort of inward-looking group of people who, beyond preaching the gospel, preaching the salvation, which is certainly a good thing, um, largely trying to avoid a fight. When I look at Christ's ministry, when I look at the ministry of the Apostle Paul, I see a lot of fighting. And they were the ones who were picking the fights. They were getting up in the morning and trying to figure out who they were going to fight next, and particularly the Apostle Paul. Now, either God does not care uh, enough about abortion to call his people into this fight, or he does care, and he is calling them, but his people are ignoring the call. Because we are radically understaffed, and we, we, we are radically understaffed, and and that understaffing can logically only be accounted for by God's indifference or our indifference. Either God doesn't care about, either God doesn't care enough about this or we don't care enough about this. And I'm here to tell you, God cares more about it than we can even imagine. So um, if there's a care deficit, it certainly falls to us. One of the reasons we have, the difficulty we have with staffing is because so many people don't think fighting abortion is something they are called to do. And I'd like to spend just a moment here uh, talking about the concept of calling, because I've, I've prayed about that. and I've, um, it, Scripture isn't really clear. There's some ambiguities about what calling actually means. But there, there, there are two, I think, infallible ways to know your calling. They're, they're just absolutely ironclad guarantees that you will be in God's will professionally for your life if one of these two things happens. The first thing is you hear the audible voice of God talking to you from the foot of your bed and you look up and he's standing there saying, okay, here's what I want you to do. Take notes. Here's when. Now, there's actually some scriptural evidence that God does talk to some people like that, but apparently not many. Certainly none I, I have ever met. So that brings us to step two in, in, the, in the two possibilities for an infallible way of determining what God's call for your life is professionally. And I would suggest the following exercise. If you, if you list the five atrocities that you believe most grieve the heart of God, might be people spending eternity in a, in, a, in a Christless outer darkness. That would have to be high on the list. Could be torturing God's image bearers to, to, to death while they're unborn children. Could be hunger, could be disease, it could be ignorance, could be poverty. List the five that you think most grieve the heart of God. Then on a scale of one to 10, Estimate the relative effort being expended to cure each of these evils. 
And if you dedicate your life to curing the most egregious of these evils, whose eradication is attracting the fewest resources, I believe you will never have to question whether you are in God's will for your life. People say to me all the time, I wish I had your passion for the unborn. I'm actually not that passionate about this, truth be known. I'm, I'm not that passionate a guy. Um, I'm embarrassed to, to admit some of the things I am passionate about because they're sort of trivial things, but abortion isn't one of them. I didn't hear the audible voice of God. I, I, I quit my job as a special assistant United States attorney for Los Angeles because somebody showed me an abortion video. And I was against abortion. I mean, I, I would actually speak against abortion. I had been a state legislator, and I had introduced legislation against abortion. I was pretty widely regarded to be something of an expert on the abortion issue, but I had never seen an abortion, principally because in 1990, there really were no abortion videos out there. And somebody produced this little, they, they pulled aborted baby bodies out of a, a trash bin and just took a simple videotape of it. And I was so stunned by this that within days, I quit. Now, my, the, that, that decision was far more cerebral than emotional or even spiritual. I just thought, how can I be a Christ follower and continue to do a job that if I quit tomorrow, 200 people will be standing in line to apply for when almost nobody with my background is defending unborn life? Am, am, am I giving God the best possible return on his investment if I take, and I, you know, I, I was a fairly decent trial lawyer, but lots of, there were lots of good trial lawyers who were ready to replace me if I left the U.S. Attorney's Office. When I left, boom. I, I mean, in 10 minutes, they didn't, they, they didn't even remember I was there because a new person was in there and seamless transition and no disruption. The world was not a different place because I left the U.S. Attorney's Office but it became a different place, a very different place, when I started doing pro-life work full time because torturing babies to death greatly grieves the heart of God. And almost nobody is doing almost anything to stop it, certainly not in the secular culture, but absolutely not in the church. For me, this isn't about passion. It's not about what offends my sense of justice. It's what offends God's sense of justice. Pastor Rick Warren, with whom, uh, you know, Saddleback Church, the celebrity pastor, and I have uh, butted heads. His office is about a mile away from our office in Southern California, and I've spent a couple of hours in his office arguing with him. I had to go home and lie down at the end of the experience. I was so frustrated, but um, he, he once made the observation that he's just not that passionate about abortion. And that's exactly how I feel. I'm just not that passionate about it. But God is passionate about it. God's immensely passionate. And, and I'll, I'll talk about that in just a moment. And so I better act as though I'm passionate about it, even though I'm not. Even though it's really not passion that's driving this. It's really more of a, it's, it's just a simple thing. I can read scripture. And I see how God responds to child sacrifice in the Old Testament. Does anybody here think abortion is not child sacrifice? I'd love to get somebody in here who thinks it's not child sacrifice, because I came here in part tonight to give you the information you need to prove incontestably that it's child sacrifice. I mean, we're moving beyond conjecture or speculation we're moving beyond the assertion that abortion is analogous to child sacrifice. Abortion is child sacrifice of exactly the sort to the same pagan deities we read about in Scripture. So, again, we need to be investing our resources in, in things that God cares a lot about. God cares a lot about the unsaved, 
and heaven knows we're falling all over ourselves to reach the unsaved. Praise God for that. That's a good thing. But he also cares a lot about babies being tortured to death who will never be born, and God's will for their life will be thwarted. They'll never reach the age of reason. They'll never have an opportunity to hear the gospel and decide whether they will or will not follow Christ. Um, and that upsets God deeply because it throws a, a wrench right into his plan of creation and salvation. It knocks it right on its ear. Unless you think this is a nominal problem, the World Health Organization says 50 million unborn babies are being killed every 12 months globally. 50 million unborn babies every 12 months. That's not homicide, that's genocide. That's systematic mass murder of a disfavored victim class, unwanted, unborn children. And we're just acting like it's a bad thing, but really not that big a deal. Not that big a deal. Now, I have observed throughout my professional career that the conventional wisdom is almost always wrong. And the indefensibility of an influential person's position on an important issue is sometimes difficult to detect until that position is challenged. Somebody can hold a really sort of nutty position, but it may not be entirely obvious that the position is nutty because nobody makes him defend it. So he says it's true. Everybody just sort of shrugs and says, OK, and they go along with it. But if you push back and force the advocate of that position to defend it, suddenly it becomes clear it's indefensible. There's no defense for it. And we, we are in the business of forcing people to defend indefensible positions. Now, why, why do we do that? Because Jesus did it. And we try to do it exactly the way he did it. Because the Apostle Paul did it. Because all of the apostles did it. Now, that's prophetic. And it gets you killed. If not persecuted, you'll be martyred. And the prophets were persecuted and martyred. Christ, the apostles. Prophetic work is, is like beyond risky. I mean, you are absolutely, the, the number of death threats we get is almost comical. I mean, it's all, I've gone, I'm, I'm beyond being alarmed by it. I mean, it's almost laughable, the number of people who want to kill us because we hold up a picture of an unborn baby. Figure that out. All right, Luke 14, one through six, one Sabbath day when Jesus went to eat in the house of a prominent Pharisee, he was being carefully watched. There in front of him was a man suffering from an abnormal swelling of his body. Jesus asked the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? But they remained silent. Now, um, so taking hold of the man, Jesus healed him and sent him on his way. First of all, there's no coincidence here that Jesus on the Sabbath decided he was going to heal someone in a very confrontational way. So he goes to the home of a prominent Pharisee um, where he knows he's being carefully watched and almost as if to shake his fist in the face of this Pharisee, he, he asks all of the Pharisees and experts in the law, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath or not? Now, why, why did he ask that, and why did the Pharisees remain silent? They remained silent because they were teaching the people that if your ox falls in, 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 in the ditch on the Sabbath, you can lift him out and it's not work because they were sort of commercial, a sort of mercenary, and your ox has commercial value, and so, yes, lift the ox out. But if your brother falls into the ditch on the Sabbath, You've got to let him die because your brother, I guess, has no commercial value. I don't know. And what Jesus was saying is what you're teaching may be the law of man, but it's not the law of God. It conflicts with the law of God. The law of God is 
save a life. And, 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 and when you have to break a rule to save a life, a man-made rule, break it. And if you don't break it, you're going to be held accountable for not breaking it. Lest we miss the point, or the religious leaders of his day miss the point, Luke 13, uh, 10 through 17, Jesus did the same thing, exactly the same thing. It's the Sabbath. He goes to the synagogue. The chief priest or the, or the, the synagogue leader is there, and Jesus sort of leans into his faith, face, and he heals right there on the Sabbath. Um, and when, when Jesus explained why he was healing, uh, Scripture says all his opponents, all Jesus' opponents were humiliated, but the people were delighted with the wonderful things he, Christ, was doing. Jesus was challenging, not authority. Jesus was not challenging the authority of the Pharisees. He was challenging their abuse of their authority. They were abusing their authority. And he, he wasn't say, saying that we shouldn't have Pharisees. He was saying our Pharisees should be following the law of God, not making up this stuff that burdens the people, that rules that they don't even keep themselves, particularly when the price for that is people are dying. The pro-life movement is sometimes thought of as a kind of a David and Goliath struggle. Um, and in, in, a, in a superficial way, that's, that, that's certainly true. But I think it's also true at a deeper level. Uh, I'm, if you'll forgive another personal reference, I'm a retired military officer. Um, I spent the last 11 years of my military career at the Pentagon as, as a reserve, ready reserve officer. And uh, I was involved in strategic planning. I was an intelligence officer. And I, I'd like to look at this encounter David had with Goliath just very briefly. We could talk about it for a long time. Just very briefly from, from a military perspective. In King Saul's time, when two roughly, the two armies of roughly co-equal combat power would encounter one another, sometimes the leaders of the two armies would decide that fighting was a bad idea, that the, that the outcome of the battle was going to be so close and so bloody that neither side could really win. It would just be carnage. And, and out of that concern evolved this uh, doctrine of single combat. And single combat meant each side would choose one person from the ranks who was their most capable fighter, and they would fight it out to the death uh, between the two armies. And the stakes were high because the winner, the side that won, was then able to enslave the side that lost. So uh, the stakes were, were quite, quite high here. And Goliath uh, is the champion of the... Philistine army, the, the, the Israelites weren't able to come up with anybody who was willing to fight this guy until David comes in, he's a boy, um, to, to bring snacks to his brothers. And David uh, is, is a very, very analytical person. Even as a young boy, uh, we, we begin to see his analytical inclinations that, that will show themselves uh, throughout his career, notwithstanding the mistakes he made. Um, and instead of being intimidated by this apparently impregnable combatant standing in front of him, David looked past the, the, the formidable combat power of this guy, and he, he looked for strategic vulnerability, and he saw a vulnerability that he thought he could exploit with his sling, which he had used before in other contexts quite successfully, but had never been used as a, as a weapon of war, and David was able to persuade King Saul to allow him to do this. And David rejected conventional weapons. David would not allow um, Goliath to, to determine what the rules of engagement were going to be or what the weapons were going to be. Uh, David chose an unconventional weapon that, that, that looked un, so unorthodox to the Israelite army that they said, this is suicide, what, what you're about to do. But David said, look, I've, I've used this sling. I've killed bears. I've killed lions that were tougher than this guy. And if I can do that, I can, I can kill this guy. 
and and what and the and the, his sling was a standoff weapon, and it was brilliant because he could stand outside the range of Goliath's weapons, and Goliath doesn't even know he's in peril, and even though David obeyed God and trusted God. Um, David didn't take just one stone, he took five stones, which suggests that, that uh, he wasn't entirely confident that he could pull this off, uh, at least not on the first try. I, 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 I would have been more impressed if he would have just pocketed one stone, but when he picked up five, that suggested there was some element of uncertainty. But David was a game changer. David changed everything by refusing to allow his adversary to dictate the rules of battle. David said, I'm not going to fight Goliath on his terms. I'm going to make him fight me on my terms. And I'm going to use tactics that have been proven to be effective in the past and, and I think can be adapted successfully here. And of course, he prevailed. The same thing is very true with the use of graphic imagery, abortion photos, uh, to convince people of the humanity of the unborn baby and the inhumanity of the act of abortion. But it's a very controversial tactic within the pro-life movement. And the principal reason that it's controversial is pro-lifers and, and most Christian leaders are trying to appease the culture. They're not fighters. And they, they desperately fear persecution. And they know when you hold up these pictures, you're absolutely, I mean, that's as prophetic as you can get in this work. And you are absolutely going to be persecuted. No question about that. Um, and... Uh, John Piper, have you ever heard of John Piper? He's a pastor in America, writes daily meditations, and, and the one for yesterday talks about how we should not fear, it's uh, uh, Paul talking to the Philippians, saying that we should not fear our opponents because suffering is a gift from God. I mean, we've, we've been granted the gift of, of suffering with Christ, suffering for Christ, by engaging the adversaries of the kingdom. That whole concept is so foreign, it's so prophetic, and it's so foreign to pastoral thinking today that, I mean, it's just, it's absolutely shocking. Now, why is that? I, I wish we had all evening because um, we're working on a project right now to reform, radically reform Christian higher education in America we're getting pastors who are weak on the abortion issue because we have seminary professors who are weak on abortion. We have Bible college professors who are weak on abortion. We have curricula that are weak on abortion in our Bible colleges and seminaries. One of the things that is revolutionary going on globally uh, with regard to Christian higher education is happening right here in Stockholm. Mott Selander is involved in an effort to get the Credo Academy uh, transitioned from its, its current status to, to full university status with much, much more serious uh, focus on Christian activism uh, in, in the abortion realm, perhaps offering an entire major for full-time involvement in pro-life ministry. That's, that's exactly what we're trying to do in the United States and in other parts of the world, if you, if you want to get better pastors, you better get better Christian higher education. And it, it's, it's, one, it's fine. We, we can't win this fight. The pro-life movement cannot win this fight without the church. And we're not going to get the church when pastors see abortion as somebody else's responsibility and they see anti-abortion activism as a threat to ministry. They don't see it as ministry. They see it as a threat to ministry. And they won't lead, and they try to block our efforts to lead in their fellowships. Now, we've made some progress with pastors, praise God. We're able to get meetings with pastors from time to time. And we're, we're able to share with them perspectives that their seminary training didn't uh, uh, expose them to. And we're able to make some progress. But that is a, that's very heavy lifting, and it's slow, and it's inefficient, and yes, we're going to continue to do that, but I want to go way back upstream from that, and I want to confront these Christian higher education faculty members and say, um, 
this isn't your college, and I say this quite respectfully. This is not your seminary. This is not your Bible college. This is our seminary. It's our Bible college. And when you give us weak pastors, uh, we can't possibly win this fight. We have a right and a responsibility to insist that Bible colleges and seminaries reform their curricula to give us the kind of pastoral leadership that will mobilize the body of Christ against this horrific atrocity, the, the bloodiest mass murder in all of human history. And there is not a seminary on the planet uh, that is adequately preparing uh, pastoral candidates to lead on this issue. That's an outrage. And we simply don't ex do not accept that. We try to think strategically. King David was a strategic thinker and, and, and a brilliant guy tactically, even as a boy. But somewhat later uh, in his walk with God, um, we, we read in 1 Chronicles 12, 23, uh, David is at Hebron, and he's assembling an army that, whose purpose will be to take the throne from King Saul. God has, has taken uh, King Saul's monarchy away from him, conferred it on David, but Saul won't give it up, and so David has to go take it. And so he's assembling an army, and he calls the very best fighters from the various tribes and um, and he's arraying them for battle in what's called an order of battle. And, and scripture says that uh, men came from one tribe uh, ready for battle. Men came from another tribe armed with spear and shield. Others were described as officers who would be the combat leaders. So each tribe was offering up its, its best fighters with specialties in a variety of diff different areas. And the first time I read this, I'm, I'm sort of waiting for what, what Scripture says would be the next combat specialty. I thought, you know, maybe it's going to be archers with bows and arrows or whatever. But, but the next combat specialty in verse 32 isn't what we would normally think of as a combat specialty. Um, it's a couple of hundred guys who are called the sons of Issachar, and the, the, the weapon they brought to the battle was their brain. They were, they were unarmed. They didn't have spears, shields, swords. They just had their brains. And scripture says they were men who had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. These were smart guys. These were the battle staff. These were the general staff, the intelligence officers, the planners who were, who were going to direct the battle. And the pro-life movement doesn't have people of that sort in large numbers because we're not strategic thinkers. Uh, we just sort of do stuff based on if it's not too risky and not too costly and we sort of like it and it's not going to invite persecution. We're in. That's what we do. Sadly, the things that most need to be done in the pro-life movement are risky, they're costly, and at least in my experience, I'm seldom very good at them. Much of what I have to do every day, I'm just not very good at. And it's sort of embarrassing that I, that I, I kind of muddle along and don't do a great job at some of the stuff I've got to do. But a poor job is better than no job. And I end up doing a poor job because there's nobody else to do some of this stuff. I can't get the help that I need. Mott's can't get the help that he needs. And we should all be embarrassed by that. Now, I, I, I could go on and on here, but I'm, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I, I'm going to show you a couple of videos, and then I, I'm going to stop. But this graphic is, in, in my humble estimation, and I don't say this immodestly, probably the most important graphic that, that, that you'll ever see regarding abortion in the church. And it, it may not look so at, at, at a glance, but... Um, the, the, the proportions of each slice of the pie on this pie chart are open to debate. I don't know what the real numbers are. I'm just sort of making up some numbers that I think are broadly representative, but I wouldn't argue um, the percentages. 
But when we ask ourselves how people become pro-life, um, the yellow uh, slice represents people who just intuit that abortion is wrong. They, they, they just sort of know it at, at a deep level. They don't have to hear anything. They don't have to see anything. It's just, it so offends their spirit that they're in, you got them, and you can move on. This orange slice is people who need to hear words, or they need to read words, the written or the spoken word. They need to read the facts, they need to read the arguments, they need the analyses, et cetera, to, to reason to their own conclusions about this. Um, the gold slice, in our experience, can be brought to a pro-life position only if you show them prenatal development. They've gotta be convinced of the baby's humanity, um, and if you can show them that visually, you've got them. The, this green slice it, it represents people who are just unreachable. They're hard of heart, they're evil, they have dark spirits. Nothing is going to move them to a, to a pro-life position. But the red slice is comprised of people who will not reject abortion until they've seen abortion. And we know these people exist because we interact with them all the time. All the time. We have women coming up to us saying, I'm pregnant, I have an abortion appointment scheduled, I would have killed my baby had I not seen the pictures. And many of these women worship someplace where they heard the pastor say that this is wrong. And maybe they heard him say it's wrong repeatedly. They, they, they sort of, at a, at a rudimentary level, knew the facts. They would have killed their babies if they didn't, if they hadn't seen the pictures. Now, all these churches that say they're pro-life and all these pro-life organizations that say they are saving lives, but which are condemning the public display of aborted baby imagery, have basically written off this segment of the population. All of the babies of all of the mothers who have to see abortion to reject abortion are just sacrificed. We, we, we just let them go. And all of the, 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 the stuff that the churches are doing and the pro-life movement is doing to reach the people who can be reached by words or can be reached by prenatal imagery, uh, sometimes in a crisis pregnancy center environment or whatever, none of those things good though they are in the abstract, life-saving though they are for people who can be reached by those things, none of those things are relevant to the mothers of the babies who've got to see abortion to reject abortion. And I, I would submit to you that, that what this phenomena can be analogized to is if a person is starving to death and they desperately need food, and I offer them a warm coat, I've abandoned them. I've forsaken them because I'm withholding the only thing that'll save their lives. And I'm offering them something that's immaterial. It, it, it doesn't meet their need. And, and yet when we engage these pro-life groups and these churches in debate about this, they, they just go on and on about all the things they're doing to reach these people and they don't want to talk about the fact that they've written off these people. Does that make sense? Does what I'm saying make sense? Because we get this all the time, and it just makes my head explode. I'm not prepared to let these babies go. I'm, I'm not prepared to just give them up to the other side, and I hope you aren't either. How, how did you get that statistic? I made it up. I don't... I don't know what the actual percentages are. I'm just telling you, okay. use your percentages. Okay. But, but there's some group of people. Of yeah, how big it is. yeah, there's it some is. group of people. Exactly. Maybe it's this big or this big. I don't know and I don't care. I mean, it's just yeah. a graphic yes. to, to address this notion that however big this group is, we're abandoning them. We're forsaking them. And I think this percentage is getting bigger because we are now a post-Christian culture, a po post-literate culture where people don't read very well and don't read very much, which means they're not very analytical. 
And people are becoming more and more visually oriented as learners. So I think this is a big, whatever it is, I think it's, it's a big percentage. The humanity of the unborn baby, the inhumanity of the act of abortion, we use pictures because, his, that, because historically um, great injustices have never been abolished by activists who covered up the horror of those injustices. They're always abolished when the injustice is exposed. Now, here's a video I'd like you to see. Um, I don't know if this light can be turned off without that light going off. Oh, yeah, that's good. That's a big help. Uh, this is an amazing video. It's direct videography of a six-week and a seven-week embryo alive in the womb. It's not ultrasound. It's not magnetic resonance imaging, which are reflected energy technology. This is direct videography of the baby. From, from a 42-minute a, a video that covers all of pregnancy, that's only about prenatal development. It's not even about abortion. I don't understand why this video is not being shown in every church in the world. I don't understand it. Little children can watch this video. There's nothing shocking in it. It's just gorgeous, gorgeous footage. By six weeks, the cerebral hemispheres are growing disproportionately faster than other sections of the brain. The embryo begins to make spontaneous and reflexive movements. Such movement is necessary to promote normal neuromuscular development. A touch to the mouth area causes the embryo to reflexively withdraw its head. The external ear is beginning to take shape. By six weeks, blood cell formation is underway in the liver, where lymphocytes are now present. This type of white blood cell is a key part of the developing immune system. The diaphragm, the primary muscle used in breathing, is largely formed by six weeks. The portion of the intestine now protrudes temporarily into the umbilical cord. This normal process, called physiologic herniation, makes room for other developing organs in the abdomen. At six weeks, the hand plates develop a subtle flattening. Brain waves have been recorded as early as six weeks and two days. Nipples appear along the sides of the trunk shortly before reaching their final location on the front of the chest. By six and a half weeks, the elbows are distinct. The fingers are beginning to separate and hand movement can be seen. Bone formation, called ossification, begins within the clavicle or collarbone and the bones of the upper and lower jaw. Hiccups have been observed by seven weeks. Leg movements can now be seen, along with a startle response. The four-chambered heart is largely complete. On average, the heart now beats 167 times per minute. 
Electrical activity of the heart, recorded at seven and a half weeks, reveals a wave pattern similar to the adults. In females, the ovaries are identifiable by seven weeks. By seven and a half weeks, the pigmented retina of the eye is easily seen and the eyelids are beginning a period of rapid growth. Fingers are separate. And toes are joined only at the bases. The video is 42 minutes long and um, seven weeks is the high end of the age range at which the chemical abortifacient RU486 is killing unborn babies. So the babies you just saw could be killed by chemical abortion. Could you repeat that, the first thing you said? Six, uh, we showed you a six week embryo and a seven week embryo which is the high end of the age range at which the chemical abortifacient RU486 is killing unborn babies. I've learned that there's some kind of difference between how old the embryo really is and how you count it within, the, within med medicine, that you count maybe... Yeah, may I, if, if, if I could clarify, menstrual weeks is two weeks longer, two weeks older than we weeks from fertilization. The babies you're seeing are aged embryologists use weeks from fertilization and OBGYNs use menstrual weeks. Weeks from fertilization is by far the more accurate way to determine the baby's age. We're getting way too bogged down in the ages. God did not become man in the person of Jesus Christ by sending Christ to earth at age 30, as he did perhaps Adam. Christ didn't come to earth, as a, it didn't become man as a newborn baby. He didn't become man in the second trimester or the third trimester of Mary's pregnancy. He became man at the moment of fertilization. So killing a single-celled zygote, which bears the image of God, is as evil in the sight of God as killing a full-term baby. So, I mean, we could just make ourselves crazy talking about all these different aging schemes and imaging techniques and all of that. That's not at all my point. This is the clearest depiction of an unborn baby you will ever see. I mean, it's direct video. That, that's the point that I'm trying to make. All right, let, let, let me wrap this up and, and then, then we'll quit. This website, ehd.org, is the supporting website for this video. The video, the narrative for the video has been translated into 90 foreign languages, 9-0, including Swedish. <coughs> which enables us to reach 80% of the world's population. Please visit the website, please use it. Now, the other side of the coin is the abortion side. I'm going to show you an, an abortion video that we produced very recently that takes a, a sales video that a chain of abortion clinics was using to sell abortions and, and we were so outraged by this that we downloaded their video and edited each time the saleswoman told a lie about abortion we edited a few seconds of abortion footage into the video and then we let her tell another lie and then we inserted another few seconds of abortion video and we did this several times and then we posted the video and that so angered the chain of abortion clinics <clears throat> that they said if you don't take these videos down, we're going to sue you. Personally, <laughs> you personally, me, as well as our organization. And I said, not only am I not taking them down, I'm working to put them up everywhere. I can find a website that will take them. Go ahead and sue me. And they did. And in their lawsuit, they said that the video I'm about to show you damaged their business, hurt their reputation, and ruined this video as a marketing tool. I said, 
I said, why, why do they think we did it? I mean, that was the point. This is tough viewing, but I want you to see it because we're not disturbed enough about this. decisions in life. Since 1973, 45 million good women in the United States have made the decision to have an abortion. One in three women in the United States will have an abortion in her lifetime. You are certainly not alone in making this choice. Deciding to have an abortion is a normal experience. We trust you, and we believe you are making your decision from a place of goodness. Goodness is courage, honesty, wisdom, risking for what you believe is right for you. Making choices that are good for yourself, that recognize your responsibility to yourself and to your family. Goodness is not perfection. It is not obedience, and it is not martyrdom. There is not one way of living a good life, and sometimes we have to make really hard choices. When a woman decides to have an abortion, she is making a choice that is thoughtful, considered, and essentially coming from a place of goodness. It is a sign of strength, courage, and responsibility to thoughtfully consider whether or not to bring new life into the world. It takes a lot of courage to make the decision to have an abortion. When you choose to come to Northland, you will be working with a staff whose courage and vision is a part of our belief in the essential goodness of our work. We have a sign hanging at Northland that reads, we do sacred work that honors women and the circle of life and death. When you come here, bring only love. We believe in the goodness of our work, and we believe in your goodness. Choosing to have an abortion does not make you a bad person. If you need help remembering that you are a good person, we are here for you. The saleswoman said, we do sacred work. That's the language of paganism. And a university professor in the United States named Jeanette Paris has written a book, which you can buy on Amazon, called The Sacrament of Abortion. She is a widely read pagan author. She's written a variety of other pagan meditations. And she says on page 107, abortion is a sacrifice to Artemis. Worshippers of Artemis nearly uh, killed the Apostle Paul in the city of Ephesus, where the, the apostles were turning 
these idol worshipers away from Artemis uh, toward the living God, and as a consequence, costing the manufacturers of the temple icons a great deal of money. Abortion is not analogous to child sacrifice. Abortion is child sacrifice. The pagans are writing books saying abortion is child sacrifice, and yet I, everywhere I go, I argue with pastors who say it's not child sacrifice. Let me close with this. Uh, St. Thomas More, on the eve of his execution for standing for righteousness, he was killed in, in an act of martyrdom, um, once asked who was the most faithful of the apostles on the eve of Christ's crucifixion. And his answer was Judas, because while the church was asleep, while the rest of the apostles couldn't manage to stay awake, Judas was serving his master. The remaining 11 apostles had failed their master. Jesus, or Judas was serving his master. He was up, he was about, he was animated, he had a plan. He was faithfully serving Satan while the church slept. And I would argue today the church is sound asleep, we have a long history of sleeping through atrocities. Books have been written on the shocking collapse of the German church as Hitler swept across, swept up Jews and propelled them to concentration camps across Europe. In America, the church was in total collapse as a witness against slavery, uh, as a witness against the evils of child labor. It's a long, ugly, dark discrediting list, and, and, and it, uh, as Francis Schaeffer says, and, and, and I, as I noted this morning, if people who claim the name of Christ are not willing to stand up against something as evil as killing a baby, the world has the right to ask whether Christ is real. And, 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 and the world is asking, and when, when we turn away from this, when we pass by on the other side, um, we, we not only discredit Christ, but we create a very strong impression. You know what, this whole thing, it's just a big, phony, baloney, fakey kind of thing. You know, it's a feel-good kind of thing. There's nothing real going on here because would people really following the risen Christ be pretending this isn't happening? That's what the world is asking, and we don't have right now um, a very satisfactory answer. Thank you so much for giving me a chance to be here. Um, it's a hard, heavy message, but the good news is we can win this by God's grace, and we will win this by God's grace. The question is, do we win it sooner or do we win it later? And you'll be the ones who will answer that question. You have somebody in Mott Silander whom we cherish and value from America. He really is a global influence on this issue, and he could be so much more effective if he weren't working with such a very small staff. Please help him. Help him financially. Help him with your time. And I would argue that you will be giving God a, a very, very good return on the investment that he's made in you.